Boogie. Disney Plus's uh, third Marvel series um, in the show where Greta Thunberg stars. I mean, just cameos. Um, but no, yeah, what a finale. What did you guys think about the finale? I, th- I personally thought it was great. I thought it was one of the best things that, you know, uh, Disney Plus has done so far. One of the best shows that Disney Plus has produced. That finale with uh, Jonathan Richards' gang was, it was something I didn't expect because the, if you look at the last two TV shows with WandaVision and um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that's kind of been disappointing with the reveals because, you know, I think we all knew that Agatha was the main villain in WandaVision. And as for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't, it was kind of obvious that it was Sharon because of all the new technology she had. And there were so many other theories. There was theories about how it could be Thunderbolt Ross. There was theories about how it could be, um, there were some theories about how, you know, they might introduce mutants to WandaVision in WandaVision. And those two sh- TV shows were disappointing in the regard that uh, they didn't introduce anything, you know, insane in the Marvel universe. But this, and because of that, you know, I wasn't expecting too much from Loki. I was, you know, kind of preparing to be disappointed. I didn't think they would introduce such a huge thing like the multiverse in Loki. And I was honestly shocked. I thought, what I thought was going to happen was there was going to be um, another Loki variant that was in control because there were a couple of references where Moby said uh, Loki is all a game that Loki made up and I mean it just gang John the majors he said that um, he wasn't going to be in the Loki show and just because of that I thought there was no chance that uh, he would show up and so it was just completely shocking to me that he was actually in in the series and it, he played it perfectly like he had that um how did i say this uh he had the play he played he had that playful like he was a playful character and then um yep and then it, i'm very interested to see like what the other loki variants are like not loki but the other gang variants are like because uh compared to this i mean it could be like much much worse yeah, I, I really like the finale as well. Um, I think it's interesting. I, th- I think sometimes the internet likes to complain just because, so we, in, in the space of a short period, we got a uh, Black Widow, which kind of was a, a short movie that um, kind of had a, like a, a strange story and like a ending that was kind of thematically satisfying, but not exactly too different in terms of just being a rushed CGI finale. And, that, and then uh, in this one, the finale was like very slow it was world and character building and uh it was setting up more and a lot of the same people still complain so it, it, it's interesting to me i i was definitely uh not shy to criticize this show before and i agree with joffrey i was kind of worried from what they had done that they just were gonna I, I was kind of more prepared for like a post-credit tease of like uh greater things to come and like the main part of the finale just being like another cj action scene but that's not at all what we got. I think it was very interesting. I think it fit in well with the world building of the show. But Jonathan Major showed off his acting chops. And I, I think it just was a very creative way to set up the future of the MCU while also uh, giving a satisfying kind of cliffhanger ending for this show and getting interested in uh, where all the characters of this show stand as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you put it well. Um... But I mean, I think you also highlight why so many people um, kind of criticized uh, this this episode is because there was a lack of action. Um, that that scene with with he who remains was like a twenty minute exposition. I think it was like half the episode. But honestly, this is this is the purpose of this season one. It served as function of trying to explain to the audience what Marvel views as their rules for the multiverse and. Honestly, I don't know if they succeeded because I myself am still kind of confused with the multiversal rules. But I mean, Jonathan Majors, when he showed up in that elevator or whatever that room, um, I, I definitely was screaming. And because obviously the casting news of him being cast as Kane to Conquer came out a, a while ago um, in Ant Man 3, but no one knew that he was going to show up in Loki. And the fact that Joffrey pointed out WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier didn't do any, anything major. So I, no pun intended. So I really didn't think that um, Marvel would do any big reveal. I was, definitely was not expecting it um, because 
you're really putting things in the Disney Plus show that has ramifications because the casual audience is not really going to try to follow every single thing. I have a lot of friends who have not watched these Disney Plus shows. So it's going to be really interesting like, to see how they set up the story to, to make it not compulsory to watch all the Disney Plus shows. Um, but that reveal is huge. Um, so, but anyway, I think we need to talk a little bit more about Kang or He Who Remains because I'm not sure if that really was Kang in, in, in the sense that, you know, the Kang that we know, the Conqueror. Um, the variant. So what do you guys think was kind of the intent uh, of the one, the version we saw in this show? Do you guys think he was benevolent? Uh, do you guys think he had some actual malicious intent? Because there are a lot of debate after this finale came out about whether Kang was actually lying to the Lokis or if he was really being truthful about being tired after a million years of watching over the timeline. You know, I, I think he was being truthful. Um, I thought they laid it out pretty well. They showed why the different characters reacted the way they did and why uh, Sylvie, and I think you sympathize with her and thought that she had at least like somewhat of a point that he may be lying, but I think they showed why, uh, laid out pretty well that he's not exactly a good or a bad guy, which I think, uh, I think that's kind of a smart way to introduce a character that they're going to be multiple versions of. But I, I think, I think he was, uh, what he was saying at Faith Valley is the case. And I think that has very interesting implications for the rest of the Marvel universe in that, yes, I think this was a satisfying goal and you understand why rooting for uh, the characters and everything that happened so far, you would sympathize with this uh, decision, but it's also gonna have wider implications. And I think that that just makes me so interested again for both what the characters in Loki are gonna be going through and the wider implications for the Marvel universe. It makes every, the wider implications more personal than they've ever been before in terms of the Marvel universe to me. Yeah, I agree with most of that. I think, um, I mean, he might have had some malicious intent in the fact that, you know, he wanted control over everything, but I think uh, his main uh, motive was, you know, prevent another multiversal war because he's seen what happened and he doesn't want uh, another Kang variant to just, you know, ruin everything again. So, I think uh, his intentions were mainly good, uh, but there might have been something else that we don't know about. Uh, we'll see, maybe they might show something else in season two, although it doesn't look like this, he who remains is gonna come back. Uh, there's probably gonna be another another variant of Kang who's gonna be in season two. Yeah, and uh, I do wanna go more into like just the show in general, but I, I think we need to talk a little bit more about this finale, two things. Um, first. The biggest moment, I think, in the show, the kiss between Sylvie and Loki. Is that incest? What is that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it's incest because, um, I mean, they're not brothers or sisters, but I, I don't like that they did that. It's kind of weird because, I mean, it's kind of the same person. It's like they're just from different um, universe, but it's uh, meant to be the same person. I, I'm not a fan of what they did there. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not gonna put myself in the position of getting uh, in, in, into a, a debate on either side on the uh, ethics of uh, alternate universe self uh, dating. Um, I just say that I think that they, the way they handled that kiss, um, I think, was good, and that it didn't last. It wasn't like, oh, Loki just made this great speech and convinced her, and then everything is great. I think it showed that while we've seen those characters progress in these ways and in this direction that they still have a lot of progress to make in terms of their relationship to each other and their character arcs. And, and that's why I'm really glad that we're getting a season two. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I apologize to our viewers. I, I didn't make, mean to spend a bit of airtime on this kiss, but I was just trying to use it as a segue uh, to when Sylvie actually pushed Loki into what we think is an alternate universe. So we see that not only does the TVA now have a statue of Kang himself, and I think what was a comic accurate uniform, um, no, no timekeeper statues, is Kang and Mobius and Hunter does not, they don't recognize Loki. So what do you guys think is happening here? Is this a new universe? Is this um, a different version of Mobius? Like what's going on? So I think this is kind of what uh, Kang was making, uh, saying in his kind of argument about the, liberty versus stability i guess and leading into i guess uh, the pitfalls of the multiverse of madness 
uh, say what you will about uh, all the morals of the TVA before, but there was stability there. And now we're very literally seeing the uh, effects of uh, instability. Now, while maybe we don't know what uh, the ethics of the this uh, King variance TVA, it's just that there are many of them. Some of them might be good, some of them might be bad, but most of all, uh, Loki and everyone doesn't really have a handle on it. Now, do I think that they've erased uh, the original Mobius and the original TVA? No, I think I think uh, the original Mobius and Loki will find them, uh, each other eventually as the show goes on. But I think it does show very, uh, in, in a very fitting way, the way that like the, the status quo we knew from this series, and I guess it'll uh, reverberate into the Marvel Universe in general, has been upended. And what we thought is uh, what we've seen so far isn't quite what we're going to get from now on. And it's going to be a difficult road to finding some kind of uh, stability with uh, all the pot events for the characters and for us viewers. Yeah, I really have no idea what happened there because, I mean, it could be another alternate universe, but then what I thought the TV it did was, you know, it just had control of all the multiverses together. So I'm not exactly sure how that works because I thought there was just one TVA that controlled everything. But I mean, it could be an alternate multiverse or it could just be that time has passed since, you know, Loki came back and uh, Kang had enough time to take control over the TVA. Yeah, I mean, I, I so at first, like, I was really mad at Sylvie for killing He Who Remains. And I, I don't think there's been a let's say an equal amount of hate for Sylvie that people showed Star-Lord in, in uh, hitting Thanos um, in Infinity War, but maybe we should be thanking Sylvie. I mean, she did, she did kind of open up this new universe of so many stories to come. Um, but I do want to go into just Loki in general um, in comparison to WandaVision, in comparison to the Falcon and Winter Soldier. Where does Loki rank um, among the three Disney Plus shows that we have seen from the Marvel Studios? And also, like, what were some big moments in this show that kind of stood out to you? I think it was easily the best one because, you know, um, Loki literally set up the multiverse. It had such a, just because it has such a huge impact on everything else. Uh, you didn't really see that from WandaVision. And I kind of thought that the WandaVision finale was kind of weak. And Falcon and the Winter Soldier was a pretty good show, but then it just set up um, Captain America 4. But then this um, Loki film, I mean, not Loki film, my bad, Loki TV series, it has so many different implications. Uh, you know, it changes everything in the MCU. Uh, it changes everything in the future Spider-Man movies and the future uh, Doctor Strange movies. And I mean, that's what I like to see. I like to, you know, I like to see the universe completely change. I don't want uh, just the show to just be focused on that one character. I want uh, things to happen in the MCU that changes everything. Yeah, uh, this might be a little bit of a cop out, but I, I had to give uh, Loki a grade. I'd say like an incomplete. Like I don't know that I can definitively uh, grade it since we know that a season, uh, future seasons are coming, and I'm, I, I think that might have an effect on how I see this season. I say I think I could definitively put it above Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I was not a big fan of that show, and I just think doing what was essentially. Uh, trying to tie up so many loose ends in six episodes with that show, I didn't think worked that great. I'm still not sure I can put it definitively yet above WandaVision. Because I think WandaVision, though the finale was uh, more disappointing than Loki's, I think it did a lot of things I liked a lot creatively. And I think it's dependent on uh, if the character arcs eventually fulfill on Loki the way, to the extent they did in WandaVision, that I think I could put it on the same level or above. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I would put WandaVision actually as my still my favorite uh, Disney Plus show because I remember with each episode the confusion that was that was with accompanying each episode. What is going on? And just had you at the edge of the seat waiting for the next week. And I think WandaVision also just kind of varied from anything else we've seen from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think it's actually been the most creative project uh, in the MCU to date. Um, 
And the Falcon and Winter Soldier, it just seemed like a Marvel movie split up into, into sex episodes. I mean, I think the purpose of a TV show really is to give you those character moments, which albeit were there, but like you said, Ethan, in six episodes, you can't really, you can't really, you know, do justice to all these plot threads that they were trying to address. Um, and obviously setting up Captain America for, and also the questions of where is everyone? You're in New, in the middle of New York, a senator's like under attack and you only Bucky and Sam and uh, Sharon Carter are there. Like that's still, that's still like making me kind of mad about the Marvel universe in general. Like where are other, all the other characters? I know they sometimes mention like in Spider-Man Far From Home, Spidey's like calling all these other Avengers, but they give like the cop out of answers saying they're not available. But I, I still think Marvel can do a better job in kind of answering those questions. Um, but yeah, I think Loki is definitely up there with WandaVision, but I still give WandaVision the edge. Um, but I guess now just looking forward to the MCU, uh, obviously this show set up so much in terms of the multiverse with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness coming out next year. Spider-Man, which is coming out this year, still not haven't seen a trailer for it. So that's kind of sad. And potentially Ant-Man, uh, well, actually not potentially, yes, Ant-Man. Uh, earlier in the beginning of this segment, Joffrey gave a Freudian slip of reference, referencing Jonathan Majors as Jonathan Richards. We know that he's related to Reed Richards, um, a, a descendant of him. So potentially Fantastic Four as well. Uh, how do you guys see this kind of opening up this? Do you think that this opens up Spideyverse, uh, uh, Spider-Verse and opening up uh, Tobey Maguire's universe and Andrew Garfield's universe? We know that Doc Ock's coming back. We know that Electro is coming back. Do we see Tobey? Do we see Garfield? Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, like you said, there are so many other villains like uh, Jamie Foxx who already announced that they're coming back and you know, it just opens up everything. And I think it would be just a great film if like they could bring back like all the other movies into the MCU. And as for um, the future of it, I'm not exactly sure because uh, this multiverse thing is huge. And I don't know if it's going to be like, it's going to be like, since it's so huge, I don't know if it's going to be like in every single movie, right? So I think that Doctor Strange, you know, he might fix it in. Uh, he might fix the multiverse in the multiverse of madness, and I think it's going to come back in the future for Secret Wars. Yeah, I think the all these connections I think are fascinating, but I think what I'm most interested to see is I think that the Fantastic Four are going to be really uh, important to this next phase or like multi phase story in the same way uh, the Infinity Saga uh, we saw. Uh, groups like the Guardians and others be uh, important. I, I think given King's comic history, I'm really excited to see where the Fantastic Four movie goes. I think Fantastic Four is due for a good adaptation given its uh, comics history. I also think that I, I, I think that they're going to be really important to what we see with uh, King and the entire place that the MCU is going so far, which I think is it kind of makes sense to use them as a driving force. I know a lot of people want them to add X-Men, but I think it makes sense uh, for the Fantastic Four to come in first, given the implications of mutants in general. And I think, I, I'm really excited to see how a lot of different characters fit in. And I think I'm interested to see, I, I don't want to uh, raise expectations too high, but uh, how could Dr. Doom, uh, one of the most fascinating characters in the Marvel IP uh, factor into a large scale conflict. Who who are the, these new Fantastic Four? You know, um, and I, I'm really excited to see Jonathan Majors as Kang in general too. Although the one thing I would worry a bit about is I hope they don't do the thing since there are different versions of the character that the villain version of uh, Kang is like way less complex and way less interesting and just kind of a mustache twirling villain. But other than that, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, in the pipeline here. Yeah, I'm with you there. And obviously Marvel has so many projects coming out in the first 10 years, 11 years of the MCU, we've seen 24 total projects. Now in just two years, we're gonna have around like 15, 16 projects. That's actually insane. So if you have not watched our Marvel Cinematic Universe or have not kept up with everything, this is your last chance to make, to make it up and do yourself a favor and go watch all those movies and shows because we're in for a huge ride. I guess my final question is, which project are you guys looking most forward to in MCU Phase 4? Um, I will give my first answer. I'll probably say Spider-Man, um, No Way Home. Doctor Strange obviously is a close second, but 
this Spider-Man movie, if they bring back Toby, if they bring back Andrew Garfield, Toby Maguire Spider-Man trilogy was my childhood growing up. So just to see all those three Spider-Men back together, that's just going to be insane. I really hope they do it justice because we have seen what happens if you put an amalgam of characters together in one movie. But Marvel has proven that they're able to do that successfully. So that's my favorite. Yeah, I would probably put Spider-Man at one. And then I think my second favorite would probably be a tie between Shang-Chi and um, Doctor Strange because, you know, Shang-Chi is a brand new character. I'm excited to see what exactly his powers are. Uh, they're introducing the Mandarin and the Ten Rings. So, you know, Shang-Chi can be an extremely powerful ring if he when he eventually gets the rings. And as for Doctor Strange, I mean, there's I have a, I have a lot of questions about it. I mean, I think they're going to fix... Uh, uh, obviously, Scarlet Witch is going to be in it, so I'm not sure who the villain is going to be in it, but I think it can be a really interesting movie. Yeah, I, I already mentioned Fantastic Four. I, I'm really into Spider-Man 2, but there's another one I want to mention. I'd say Black Panther 2. Um, I think the it's going to be a really emotional, cultural moment uh, with everything that happened with Chadwick Boseman, and I think uh, the impact he had and the people kind of mourning his death. And I think they're going to get, do a good job uh, honoring that legacy as well as I think just in general, I think what kind of felt, what felt like a really rich world and that drew people in and made that first movie so popular. I think exploring more and seeing kind of this passing of the torch, I think, well, it, I think creatively and emotionally, I think I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm with you there. And with that, that wraps up our Loki show review um, but what if is next Marvel series coming out on Disney plus in August, and that will have heavy multiversal themes. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes this review. Thanks. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to our channel, the M to M network for more sports and entertainment content.